Love you. That means tests will be on Monday. Friday. Monday. But Friday is fine. I can get it printed. Okay. <laughs> so, 2 5. So, this is the part where you guys were like, hey, can we just use that trick? I know what the derivative is. You guys need to put your phones away <laughs> and look up. Sorry. I'm texting Michael. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, first thing that you should take a look at is this. Whoa. Notation. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's not cool. That's great. Sorry, my one note was freaking out on me. <laughs> yeah, I was teaching about John Travolta's last class. Yeah, so this is your basic rule. Yeah. Okay, uh, do you notice the notation that they say? Okay, the expression d dx. Okay, it just means that we're deriving in terms of x. So just like when you're using function notation, you generally see f of x saying, hey, we're going to have this function that's in terms of x. Okay, so this is, hey, we're going to have this function, and we're going to have an x, and we're going to drive in terms of x. Okay, um, you can also see it like this, dy dx. Okay, so these two notations mean the exact same thing. Sorry, that's super dark for you, but you have it in front of you, right? Okay, so just so you know, those are two things. The only difference is the y, the dy dx is slightly more informative, meaning we have a, an equation of y that's in terms of x. Okay. All right, so do you guys remember this power rule? Okay, that is the basic derivative rule that you learned last year. Okay, so all that happens... <laughs> is you take the, the exponent and you multiply by whatever is in the front. So if there happens to be another number, you multiply it, and then your new exponent is just simply one less than it. Okay, so we'll do some examples. Um, did you know that the derivative of any constant is zero? Okay, and the reason behind that is, um, think about Think about an equation that is simply a constant. So like if I was going to graph y equals 5, okay, y equals 5 is a flat line, right? What's the slope of a flat line? Zero. So that's why the derivative of a constant is zero. We're talking about the, the slope. Um, the scalar, we'll talk about that. That's just if there's a number in front. And the sum rule is like you can just derive each term separately. Okay. All right, you guys ready? Let's do this. All right, so question number one. We are given x to the fourth. What is the derivative of x to the fourth? Okay, so we take the four, we throw it in the front, and our new exponent is simply one less than that. So the derivative is 4x to the third. Is everybody okay with that? I know that we have people who are just learning this and people who have seen it already, so um, if you're just learning this, give me a sign that you get it. Good so far? Okay. Let me know if you're like, what just happened? All right. Tell me about number two. So number two, we're going to drive each term independently. So if I take that exponent, move it to the front, what do I get? Good, so I have negative 2 thirds x. Now I subtract 1. Be careful here. If I subtract 1 from negative 2 thirds, what do I end up with? Good, negative 5 thirds. And what is the derivative of 3? Zero. So I don't have to say plus 0. Um, now technically, can I leave it like that? No, you can't leave a negative exponent like that. So Remember, a negative exponent, it just simply gets moved, bless you, into the denominator. You guys want to give me that phone? Put it away, or you can go outside and shut the door behind you. So, I have a top and I have a bottom, right? So, 2 goes in the top, the 3 goes in the bottom. 
So now when I move that x downstairs, notice that the exponent turns positive. Okay, so as soon as I move it, it goes away, right? Is everybody okay with that one? Okay. All right, now question number three starts out a little bit more complicated in the fact that um, the t is in the denominator. Okay, so before I derive it, I need to rewrite it. Okay, because I can't use my basic rule. So if I was going to rewrite it and take that t out of the bottom, what would its new exponent become? Negative 3. So this is going to be 5 minus 1 half t to the negative third. Okay, so I rewrite it, and now I can use my basic rule, that power rule. Okay, what is the derivative of 5? 0, so the 5 goes away. So now I have the derivative of negative 1 half t to the negative third. So I'm going to multiply the negative 3 times the negative 1 half. So what's negative 3 times negative 1 half? 3 halves. Good. So 3 halves t. And if I subtract 1 from my given exponent, what's negative 3 minus 1? Negative 4. Negative 4. Good. Now, can I leave it like that? No. No, I got to move it. I got to put it into the denominator with the 2. And now I have a positive exponent. How do we do on that one? Good there. OK. All right, let's try number 4. Now, number 4, the x is in the bottom. So what do I need to do first? I got to rewrite it. Now, notice that the 2 is also in parentheses. OK, so the 2 also has that exponent. So I need to deal with the 2 to the third power. So what is 2 to the third power? 8. So I'm going to write this as 5 eighths. And I'm pull the x out and turn the exponent negative. Everybody good with that first step? <coughs> Okay, so now I'm going to derive it. So I'm going to multiply my exponent by my value in front. So I have 5 eighths times negative 3. What's 5 eighths times negative 3? Good, negative 15 eighths. And if I subtract 1 from negative 3, negative 4. So this is going to turn into negative 15 over 8x to the 4th. Good there? Okay. So that's your basic rule. Okay, so let's check out um, higher order derivatives. Okay, so all this is, is you can keep deriving. So I can take the derivative of a derivative, which would be a second derivative. Okay, so do you see the little... Um, it kind of looks like an apostrophe, right? So the apostrophe, that's your notation. So one apostrophe is a part first derivative, two, second, third, and so forth. Okay, so those are all your different notations that you could see. That looks familiar to everyone. Okay, so all we are going to do for question number five is now take a second derivative and then we'll plug in our negative 8. So before I take the derivative, my x is in the bottom, so what do I need to do? Rewrite it. Rewrite it. So if I have a root, what is a cube root the same as? So what is that exponential form of that? Uh, a, a cube root is a 1 third, but if I already have a 2 there, the exponential 2, it'll be a 2 thirds. So this would really be the same as 2x to the 2 thirds, but now if I bring that x upstairs and make the exponent positive, it'll turn into 1 half x to the negative 2 thirds. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so now I can do a derivative. Do a different color. So if I derive that and multiply my exponent times my value in front, what's one half times negative two thirds? Good. So I get negative one third. And if I subtract one from negative two thirds, that gives me negative five thirds. Good. 
And I'm not going to simplify because notice I'm going for a second derivative. So I'm going to derive again. Okay, so now taking my blue one and doing negative one third times negative five thirds. Five, everybody with me? Five ninths. Positive times a positive. And if I subtract one from negative five thirds, good, negative eight thirds. <laughs> Okay, so now I can simplify that one. So that one would be the same as 5. Uh, you don't have to because we're going to plug a negative 8 into it. So uh, you, you're right, you don't have to. So I'm just going to just, I don't know, good practice, I guess. Okay, and now I can do second derivative, and now I'm going to plug 8 into it. And we should be able to do this, hopefully, without a calculator. Maybe not, because it's to the 8th. Yeah, maybe not. Okay. And it's a negative 8 to the 8 thirds. So we could probably do some of this. Um, so on the bottom there, I have 8 thirds. So that's a cube root of negative 8. What's the cube root of negative 8? Negative 8 thirds. Negative 2. So then I would have negative 2 to the 8th power. So that would be like 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. Yeah, I think it's 64, right? And it'll be to a positive, it'll be a positive 64. And then 64 times 9, I don't know what that is. I feel like we did pretty dang good without using a calculator to that point. It's what? 2,304. Okay. Is everybody okay? Hey, you guys need to move on. We're in the middle of something. Mm hmm. Okay. So we're good with that one. Does that one make sense to everybody? Okay. So the second half of this is finding the equation of the tangent line. Okay. So I'm going to give you a hint with finding the equation of a tangent line. I think that finding the equation of the tangent line. <laughs> A tangent line will always be linear, and the easiest form to use with calculus is point-slope form. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the form that we're going to be putting this into, I would write this down and probably highlight it, is this form. Okay, because we're going to be given a point, the derivative finds the slope, so we'll be, we'll be given a point slope, and then we don't have to worry about making it more complicated. Okay. Um, the normal line. Have you guys heard of the normal line? <coughs> so the normal line is simply perpendicular to the tangent line. So this is the notation. Do you guys remember perpendicular is simply a negative reciprocal? Do I need to do an example of a perpendicular slope? So like, if, if the slope that I found initially was 2 thirds, what would the perpendicular slope of that be? Negative 3 halves. Okay, so perpendicular is going to be the slope of the normal line. Normal line. Alright, so let's try it. Uh, question number six. So it says, find the equation of the tangent line. So given the function, and we're going to do it at the point 1, 6. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find the slope at the given point. Okay. So how do I find a slope? Uh, how do I find the slope? Change in y over change in x. So finding the slope is how we find the we find the derivative. OK, 
Okay, so when you take the equation, you find the derivative. Derivative is your slope. Okay, and then what we'll do is find the slope at the given spot, at the given point. Okay, so to find slope, we're going to do the first derivative. Okay, so taking the derivative of that function, what is the derivative of 4x to the fifth? 20x to the fourth. 20x to the fourth. What is the derivative of 3x squared? 6x. So minus 6x and the derivative of 5. 0. 0. Okay, so that'll give you the slope at any point, but we are specifically looking at the point 1, 6. Okay, so I'm going to use the x value to plug into my derivative so that I can find the slope at exactly 1, 6. Okay, so if I plug 1 in, what is the slope at 1, 6? Wow, that's a big slope. <laughs> 14. Okay, so 14 is my slope. Okay, the point that I have is 1, 6. I'm now going to plug that into my point slope equation. Okay, so how is that going to go? Y minus. What's my y1? 6. So we're using this point right here. Equals the slope <coughs> times the quantity of x minus the x1. x minus 1. Right. Okay, so that is the equation of the tangent line. Does everybody understand what that's finding? Like, do I need to draw a picture of what we're doing here? It's like the It's like a straight line that intersects the graph. Right? Yeah, like if I was going to draw um, this function, it would be a John Travolta that kind of looks like this. And if I was going to plot the point 1, 6, let's say it's right there, okay, the slope of the tangent line, the tangent line would just kind of be, if I was going to try to find the exact slope right at that spot, something like that. Okay, so that blue equation right there would be the equation of that tangent line. Okay. All right, so the second part of this, number seven, says now what is the equation of the normal line? Okay, so the normal line is simply taking the same point but now using a perpendicular slope. So if my slope of the last one was 14, what's my perpendicular slope? Negative Good, negative 1 14th. So now my point is the same. This is going to be a very small change in the equation. The only difference here is going to be that slope. Okay, so finding the equation of the normal line is not much different than finding the equation of the tangent line. Okay. All right, what's next? Okay, so we got uh, non-differentiability. Okay, so these are places that you cannot find the slope of. Okay, so the first one is a hole. Okay, which hopefully should make sense. We can't find the equation of a tangent line when it doesn't exist right there. Okay, so if there's a hole, we cannot take the derivative. If there is a jump, we cannot take the derivative. If there's a vertical asymptote, we cannot take the derivative. Now, a sharp <coughs> turn, that's kind of a unique situation. The function is continuous, but the sharp turn, it would be too hard to kind of figure out like what line would be tangent to that. You guys see what I mean by that? There's too many possibilities. Okay, so a sharp turn is a unique situation. Okay, and then the last one is a vertical tangent. Okay, so we cannot take uh, find the slope because it's an undefined slope. Okay, vertical line. Okay. All right, so we do have a little note. It says if a function is not continuous, it is not differentiable. I feel like that should be highlighted. If a function is not continuous, it is not <laughs> differentiable can't find the equation of its tangent line. 
Okay, and there's still a possibility that it's not differentiable if we have a vertical asymptote, so if the slope is undefined, or we end up with a sharp turn. Okay, sharp turns are the hardest to find, so guess what we're going to learn about? Sharp turns. Okay, so question number eight says uh, we're going to decide whether or not it's differentiable. Sharp turn. Okay. Um, why do you say sharp turn? Because absolute value is a sharp turn. Yeah, right? So absolute value is literally a V. So there's only one sharp turn though, right? Okay, so there's only one location where this function is not differentiable at. So where is the one place that this function is not differentiable at? Zero. So it is not differentiable at x equals zero, okay? It is technically differentiable on all other values. Okay, question number nine. So question number nine, let's kind of draw it and see what it would look like because there might be, again, a sharp turn. Um, if I was gonna draw x squared for x values less than zero, so that's to the left, I have a parabola, right? So it'd be a parabola that just stops at zero. <laughs> Sorry, that was a ter I can't get it to zero. Okay, and then my right side is just x. So x is just a linear function that goes up. So greater than zero. So is that a sharp turn? What do you guys think? Yeah. It's really close, right? How sharp, it's, is, a sharp how sharp is a sharp turn? That's a good question, really right? How do you decide how sharp of a turn it is? Okay, so this is how you figure it out. Okay, if we can decide, number one, that the function is continuous if we're working with a piecewise function, okay, then it is potentially differentiable. Okay, so uh, the next thing that we would do is we would derive both pieces and see if the slope at that spot is the same, okay? So what I mean by that is, let's first take the derivative of each piece, okay? So the top piece is x squared. What is the derivative of x squared? 2x. So we have 2x uh, for values less than zero. On the bottom, the second one is x. What is the derivative of x? One, okay, for x values greater than one. Okay, so now if I find the slope at each of those two places where it comes together, if they're the same, then the function is differentiable. Okay, so do you see how it comes together at zero? So if I plug zero into both of those derivatives, are they the same? Top piece would be a slope of zero. What's the bottom slope? One. So is it a sharp turn? It is a sharp turn. Okay, so not differentiable, oops, exactly, they have to be the same in order for it to be differentiable at x equals zero, okay, so it's a sharp turn. Okay, oh, I forgot to say on question number nine, why, sharp turn. Okay, let's try question number 10. So number 10, first thing that I need to do is kind of think of a picture. Is the function continuous? Okay, if I was gonna graph the left piece, I have my x squared, so I have a parabola that goes to zero. Okay, my bottom piece, what does the bottom piece look like? Yeah, so it's moved up one. So is the function continuous? No. So I don't even have to take the derivative. I can go straight to the fact that um, this function is not differentiable at zero because it's not continuous. Because it's because Okay. How close are we? We've got to be close. 
the last one? Oh, good. We already talked about it. Oh, we're not done. There's two. There's still two more down here. They blended in. Okay. So, what about question eleven? What about question eleven? So what's happening? I have, there's two values where this function is not continuous. Okay, there's a hole. So we're going to say hole at x equals 0. So it's not differentiable there. And vertical asymptote at x equals 1. So those are the two places that it's not differentiable at. <laughs> Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. What about number twelve? Continuous. All reals. Okay. So, uh, if I derive this one. Okay. Oops. Let's just rewrite it. So, if I rewrite this function, I have x to the one third. And if I derive it, what's the derivative of x to the one third? To the negative two thirds. So that would be the same as one over three x to the two thirds. So that gives me an x in the bottom. So that tells me there's one place where this function is not differentiable. Anything that makes my derivative zero, it is not differentiable. Okay, so what is the one place? At zero. Four thirds. Oh, uh, one third. One third. You would be right if it was a negative. Yeah, yeah. So not differentiable at x equals zero because we have a vertical tangent line. Okay, the slope is undefined when x is equal to zero. Uh -huh. Okay, you know what you got to do. Okay, uh, this right here, I talked about this yesterday. Oh my gosh, I, like 10 minutes ago. Okay, it was like an hour ago, but... Uh, we talked about average rate of change, yes? Yeah. Right? A rock, y2 minus y1. Instantaneous rate of change? Just derive it. Just derive it and plug it in. <coughs> do you guys need me to do these two examples? I'll do them super fast. <laughs> Uh, okay, so they give us two x values. First thing I have to do for 13 is find its corresponding y value. So I have 10 to the third plus 2 times 10. <coughs> so 1,000 plus 200. Boy, that's a giant y. 1,200. Or 20. Oh, yeah, thanks. Good catch. Thank you. Um, and then if I plug 30 in, uh, 30 cubed plus 2 times 30 is 2,700 plus 60. So that's 2,760. How how'd I do on my math that time? Better? So now if I do change in y over change in x, it's going to be 2,760 minus 1020 over 30 minus 10. Uh, well, I know it's over 20. What? 1740 over 20. Uh, 87. Good. So average rate of change would be 87. Not bad. Those are giant numbers. So versus doing an instantaneous rate of change, instantaneous rate of change is just at one specific point. Okay, so all you do for instantaneous rate of change is find its derivative. So if I was going to find the derivative, what would be the derivative of our f of x? 3x squared plus 2 
right? Because you lose the x. Does that make sense why the x goes away? <laughs> so now all I do is I take the x value and I plug it in. So 300 plus 2. Yeah. Yes. So anybody get 302? That one makes sense to everybody? Okay, so think of 2x as being 2x to the first power, right? So if I would do 1 times 2, so that gives you the 2 in the front, and then I have x to the 0 power, which means there's 0 x's, and that's why it goes away. Mm -hmm. Um, find the value of the derivative at the, yeah, so you just derive it, plug in the x value, yep, that's it.